Hi, and welcome to this short review on using ultrasound guidance for subclavian central venous catheterization. I am Leon Baker, an internist, intensivist, and critical care ultrasound fellow at the University of Alberta. One of the most common opinions on subclavian line insertion is that it is a blind procedure, and that most providers prefer to have this as such. This was certainly my opinion too, until I was shown just how much easier ultrasound can make this procedure. Why keep yourself blind if there is a way to see where you are going? Subclavian vein cannulation being a non-ultrasound guided procedure is very common. In fact, in this cross-sectional survey done across the USA between 2014 and 2015, found that ultrasound was routinely used for internal jugular insertion, but not so for subclavian vein placement. The most common reason for this was limited access to ultrasound machines. I must admit that this sounds odd, as that apparent limited access does not seem to pose a barrier for internal jugular insertion. It is however known that internal jugular vein insertion is easy and has a fairly low complication rate. This certainly could have overpowered the need for subclavian vein cannulation. Another reason could be the belief or perceived obstruction posed by the clavicle in gaining good views of the subclavian vein. Neither of these reasons were however evident in this survey. My objectives for this short review is as follows. We'll take a look at the relevant anatomy, then we'll turn our attention and briefly look at the evidence to see if there is any support for using ultrasound for this procedure. Next, we will briefly describe ways of acquiring the views needed. Note please that this is not a review of in-plane or out-of-plane needle insertion techniques. For this, I refer you to any good textbook. Next, we will take a look at real-time videos of what the anatomy looks like on ultrasound. Firstly, let's turn our attention to the relevant anatomy. Let's start by looking at the internal jugular vein. This is after all the place where, where central venous catheters are most commonly placed. It is found vertically and anterior laterally on the side of the neck. It joins the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic or innominate vein. Central venous catheters are usually inserted between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Moving laterally, let's consider the large vessels coming from the arm. We'll start with the axillary vein. The axillary vein is formed more distally by the anastomosis of the basilic and brachial veins laterally in the arm. This is not depicted on this cartoon. The axillary vein is then formed and runs all the way to the lateral border of the first rib, which is more or less in line with the anastomosis of the cephalic vein. Next, we'll turn our attention to the, the subclavian vein. The subclavian vein starts at the lateral border of the first rib and runs until it anastomoses with the internal jugular vein. As you can see, it soon dives below the clavicle. Next, let us turn our attention to the literature. We'll start with this review article. In it, they identified four major studies that compared landmark techniques to ultrasound guided placement. Most notably, Two papers found very favorable findings. The first one would be this one by Frejou et al. In it, they found that ultrasound guidance was found to improve success rates markedly. There was a reduced rate of mechanical complications, including arterial puncture and hematoma formation. Most notably, though, there was a reduction in the rate of pneumothoraces. This was thought to be likely secondary to the ability to visualize the needle and prevent posterior vessel wall penetration. The next one was this last paper, 
In it, they found increased success rates for inexperienced operators and a reduction in minor complications. Next, in this Cochrane review in 2015, comparing subclavian, subclavian vein cannulation to femoral vein cannulation, with or without the use of ultrasound, 13 studies were identified. A total pooled participant number of 2,341 were found. Ultrasound guidance were used in nine of these studies specific to the subclavian vein, and in that they found reduced arterial puncture, reduced hematoma formation, and therefore concluded somewhat small gains for the use of ultrasound. Next, we'll turn our attention to this 2013 meta-analysis looking at central venous catheter cannulation using ultrasound versus a landmarking technique. They identified 26 studies with 4,185 participants. Overall, they found that in the ultrasound groups, there were decreased cannulation failure, decreased hematoma formation, decreased arterial puncture, and decreased pneumothorax formation. These findings were mirrored by two other meta-analyses, which found that there was a significant reduction in arterial puncture and hematoma formation, as well as an improved rate of successful cannulation using real-time ultrasound with a longitudinal in-plane infraclavicular approach. Therefore, overall, the common themes seem to be less arterial puncture, less pneumothorax formation, less hematoma, as well as reduced attempts. For a further deep dive and discussion of the evidence, I refer you to this wonderful textbook. So how do you acquire the views required for subclavian vein cannulation guidance? Again, I refer you to this wonderful paper by Rizayat et al. <clears throat> In it, you will find a step-by-step -step guide. So let's break it down. We will first turn our attention to the short axis view. This view is obtained by placing the linear high frequency probe in a longitudinal orientation with the probe marker towards the patient's head, close to the sternoclavicular joint. The probe is gently moved laterally towards the arm to identify all the relevant anatomy. We will first break it down by looking at some still pictures. Here we can identify the clavicle, the subclavian vein, the subclavian artery, and very importantly, the pleural line. Next, the probe is moved slightly more lateral until the cephalic vein comes into view. This is the next point of interest. On still pictures again, identify the clavicle, the subclavian artery, the subclavian vein, and the pleural line. Note, as mentioned, the cephalic vein is the only difference in this view. This, in ultrasound terms, denotes the start of the auxiliary vein as you move more laterally. Moving laterally still, you will find views of the auxiliary vein and auxiliary artery. First you find the axillary vein, and next to it, the axillary artery. Note, however, that the axillary artery is wrapped in a neurovascular bundle, and attempted access this far lateral increases the risk of neurovascular injury. Next, views can be obtained using a transverse orientation. This will give you a long axis view of the relevant anatomy. The probe is therefore turned transverse with its marker towards the operator. In the still picture, identify the distal subclavian vein, the proximal auxiliary vein, the cephalic vein. Again, note that in ultrasonography terms, the cephalic vein denotes the start of the proximal axillary vein. Note also, that the subclavian artery will only be visible by aiming the probe a little bit more cephalad. The long axis view of the anatomy has the added benefit of visualizing more anatomy at any given time. It also creates the possibility of in-plane cannulization 
Remember again that this tutorial is not aimed at discussing in-plane or out-of-plane canalization. Next we'll briefly turn our attention to identifying veins versus arteries. For this we will employ compressibility as well as different forms of Doppler. In this presentation I hope to demonstrate these techniques in the videos at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> For a quick explanation however, I will use still pictures from the review article from Razette et al. I'm also assuming some familiarity with the use of pulsed wave Doppler, but suffice it to say it allows the measurement of blood cell velocity at a specific given point. So how can you use pulsed wave Doppler to differentiate veins from arteries? Using the long axis plane, place pulse wave Doppler with angle correction inside the vessel that you are interrogating. Typical venous flow will be seen in veins. This is typically a continuous venous hum or in this example some pulsatility. Note that the flow direction although it is dependent on your angle of interrogation is in general away from your probe. On the right is an example of arterial pulsability. It is demonstrated here with its dichrotic notch. Note also that the velocities are much much higher and in that in this example the flow is towards the probe. Again this may depend on your angle of interrogation. What about arm positioning? Does arm positioning change the visible vascular anatomy on ultrasound? This anatomical study using ultrasound visualization would suggest so. In this study, which was an anatomic ultrasound study of healthy non-pregnant volunteers between the ages of 18 to 50, the one group had their arm in the neutral position. The next group had their arms in 90 degree abduction, 90 degree flexion of the shoulder, and external rotation. In this study it was demonstrated that in the abducted arm position the cross-sectional area of the vein was increased. The depth of the vein was also reduced. Unfortunately there was no difference in the distance to the subclavian artery or the pleura. Again please note that this was an anatomic study. What about the target? As noted a little bit earlier Given the anatomy, the vessel most commonly cannulated using this technique will be the axillary vein. Focus should therefore be on a few things. Firstly, the target point should be approximately 4 cm from the mid-clavicle, denoted here by the white block in this cartoon. It should also be where the vein is seen at its largest and most superficial, and of course, the furthest away from the pleural line as well as the axillary artery. Note that the more lateral you move, the more risk you have of causing a neurovascular injury. So what does the anatomy look like? For this, we will turn our attention to short axis videos first. Note again that as explained earlier, the probe is in the longitudinal plane with the probe marker towards the patient's head. The probe is then moved laterally as the anatomy is followed on screen in real time. Here is what it looks like. The first point of interest is the clavicle. Note its shadow. Next, the subclavian vein comes into view. Then the subclavian artery. Then the pleural line is identified. Note the variability of the subclavian vein. Moving further lateral, the axillary vein and axillary artery will come into view. Here is the axillary vein and next to it the axillary artery. In another example, this time in a patient with slightly larger targets, the following will be seen. <laughs> 
In this example, the cephalic vein also becomes visible. Also note that in this video, the operator moves laterally from the most medial point until the axillary vein and axillary artery is identified. The operator then moves back medially to assess the best access point for the cannulation. Compressibility is used to confirm venous access. Let's have a look. Again, the clavicle is identified, the subclavian vein. There's the subclavian vein again, subclavian artery, vein, and cephalic vein. Here is the axillary vein, axillary vein again, and moving back medially, the target is identified. Note the compressibility. Next, we will take a look at what the anatomy looks like in the long axis. Recall that this view is obtained by placing the probe in a transverse fashion with the probe marker towards the operator. Note that in this video, a few additional things will be seen. Other than identifying some key anatomy points, the use of compressibility, color Doppler, and pulse wave Doppler will be employed to differentiate arteries from veins. Let's watch. The subclavian vein is identified. Next, the subclavian artery is identified. Note the pulsatility or variability of the subclavian vein. Color Doppler is applied. Note that some pulsatility is seen. With pulse wave Doppler, the flow is away from the probe. Here is an oblique view with vo both vessels in view and adding some color, the difference between arterial and venous flow is clearly seen. Next, the subclavian artery is identified with color Doppler. Placing pulse wave Doppler through it reveals typical arterial pulsatility with high velocities and flow towards the probe. Dichrotic notching can be seen in some of these waves. I hope that this short tutorial was able to demonstrate that the visualization of the subclavian vein and axillary vein with ultrasound is feasible and easy. The literature suggests using ultrasound guidance to reduce mechanical complications and increase accuracy. I hope that this video will inspire you to at least investigate the feasibility of this and perhaps start using it in your practice in the future. Ultimately, yes, you can do this procedure blind, but why? Thank you very much for listening. Take care out there.